Hello, my name is Wayne Arnett and I'm going to talk about disability awareness with a particular focus on mental health. This is the second in a series of sessions aimed at raising awareness of how to support students with a disability who are undertaking healthcare practice on a proprietary programme. There have been a number of legal and professional regulatory changes in the United Kingdom that require higher education institutions to make reasonable adjustments for students who have any health problem and particularly mental health problems. This presentation takes you through some of the issues that arise when attempting to support students with a disability. This presentation will incorporate clips of actors conveying real life experiences of students who've undertaken a healthcare programme. The aim is to raise awareness amongst mentors who support students in practice so that they can get an idea of how to best help and to avoid making the situation worse, but also ensuring that students have the best experience possible. One of the most frequently raised issues is the concept of reasonable adjustment. Reasonable adjustments are those things we should be doing that are reasonable to support students who are learning and provide reasonable adjustments or make reasonable adjustments to students' programmes, both in the academic setting, when they are undertaking exams or writing assignments, and reasonable adjustments also need to be extended to the practice setting. It is also important to recognise that this is a multidisciplinary issue in that although the mentor who supports the student may be of a particular discipline, the reasonable adjustment needs to be extended to other team members who might be supporting the student learning in practice. For example, a mental health student who is undertaking a practice placement in a clinical environment may encounter psychologists, psychiatrists and social workers, as well as mental health nurses, Although it is the mentor who has the primary responsibility for the student's learning, other people are involved in this process and will therefore need to understand where reasonable adjustments to the student's learning has been made. It is also important that those supporting the students understand how coping strategies are used by people to overcome potential restrictions for students and ensure we comply with the relevant law. This isn't something we do voluntarily. It is something we're obliged to do under the law. And so we in the university and people who are providing support in practice need to work in partnership to support students and to alert each other of potential issues so that the student can be supported as best as possible. We're going to start by going through some of the mental health problems commonly encountered and more importantly, how they may manifest themselves. Of course, mental health problems are very common in society and can manifest themselves in a wide variety of ways, but typically people will complain about feeling low in mood. They may lose concentration or are unable to focus on a particular task for long periods of time. They may lack confidence or they may believe that other people are judging them in a negative way. They may appear tired and lack in energy and this may be down to the fact they are not sleeping well or may appear overly anxious in certain situations. Of course, we all experience anxiety when we are faced with certain stressful events. So anxiety, not an unusual experience, but people with mental health problems may experience periods of intense anxiety that can impact on their ability to cope or function in particular situations. Their thinking may become muddled, so when communicating or trying to convey an idea, they may not be able to explain things as clearly as they would like because their thinking becomes illogical due to the amount of stress that they are experiencing. They may experience appetite changes, which may be exhibited through weight loss over a period of time, or they may be off their food or even overeat and resort to comfort eating to cope with the stress. It is important to keep an eye out for those obvious signs and symptoms that someone may be experiencing problems. Another manifestation that may occur is work inconsistencies. For example, arriving late for work, or they may come in very early for a shift, well before they are required to attend. Or they may have to go off work early through periods of sickness, and the reasons go on and on. So again, the important thing around this is the relationship between the student and the mentor, and their ability to communicate openly and honestly about issues and problems that they are encountering. I'm going to stop there and allow you to listen to a clip from Tara, 
which describes very nicely some of the symptoms she was experiencing and how that led into some of the problems that she had faced in practice. I'm a third year student with bipolar disorder. Uh, I was on a placement about halfway through and my mentor came up to me and took me to one side and she was really negative. She said she thought I'd been burning the candle at both ends, but I hadn't. I hadn't been doing anything like that. But she didn't believe me. And after that, she didn't believe anything I said. So the rumours started to spread around and some people just carried on with me regardless, but the atmosphere got really bad. Um, no one asked how I was. They'd just say things like, why aren't you doing this? Um, and just making assumptions. Um, I suppose because I was feeling really down, although it was just a little thing, it really affected me. And I might have ignored it, but because I was already feeling low, people should be really careful with what they say. The worst thing about my lows is they make me feel really worthless. They make me feel like I don't deserve any help. But if they had come to ask me if I was okay, they could have suggested maybe I take some time off because looking back, I really shouldn't have been there. There was a time in my second year and I was feeling really low. So I said that I was gonna take myself off for a couple of days. I just said that I didn't feel very well. Um, and then I came back and no one said anything. Um, my mentor said, I hope you feel better, but nobody asked any questions, which I thought was good because I didn't feel pressured to disclose anything. Um, sometimes people said like, how are you? Um, but that was good because it meant that I could talk about it if I wanted to. That clip from Tara, I think, illustrates some frustrations and concerns that Tara experienced when she was on placement, and these aren't uncommon. The next slide I'm going to talk through lists some of the common concerns that students have shared with us who have experienced mental health problems in practice, and this was from a study we previously conducted by interviewing students with those disabilities. Many of these are common in the sense that they are personal perceptions of what is going on in that practice environment. They may fear that due to falling behind with their studies, this adds to the stress that they may be experiencing at that time. And as Tara said, they can feel judged and possibly victimised because sometimes they feel mentors don't fully understand mental health problems and therefore make judgments about their behaviour without understanding the reasons for that behaviour. Students sense that their practice may be perceived as poor, even if it isn't. They also have that perception about themselves, and that can be linked to what I mentioned earlier on, and that was the lack of confidence in their own abilities. This whole issue around understanding and support for mentors is a really important one, and is the purpose of this presentation. The presentation will also help mentors consider alternatives to labelling the student for turning up late displaying high levels of anxiety or their inability to concentrate by considering other underlying issues that may need further investigation and additional support. Students are in practice to learn and are expected to perform certain tasks and functions to achieve certain competencies and if they are experiencing mental health problems they may be unable to recall new learning. An example of this may present itself when they have been shown a new task and been provided with the rationale. But when they come to replicate that procedure, they cannot always recall what they were taught. This again may indicate an impairment that requires further investigation and support. Communicating and the difficulties associated with that student attempting to communicate their concerns or practice issues, coupled with the possibility of being misinterpreted or misunderstood due to preconceived ideas and judgments about the student's ability, can collectively result in the student's inability to engage fully in the practice experience. It may well be that a simple procedure could be put in place to help the student at that time, and that is something we'll move on to in a second. I'm going to now break and let Chelsea illustrate how some of these concerns I've talked about manifest themselves in practice. 
Um, I'm a second year student nurse with depression and I've not told any of my mentors in any of my placements about my depression because I've been made to feel quite reluctant to say because when I see patients come in who've self-harmed and I see how the nurses react to them and how they treat them, it makes me think and wonder what, how they would react to their colleagues if they knew that their colleagues had mental health problems and the way people react when you maybe say you have dyslexia or another problem they, they, they're quite accept, accepting of it but when people have mental health problems it's a lot harder to say. So from Chelsea's account, it can be seen that she was reluctant to tell her mentor about her concerns and problems because she wasn't sure that they would be willing to understand or listen to her concerns, or in fact, how they might judge self-harm in that situation. The next slide I'm going to talk about discusses some of the concepts we typically implement for students in practice, and these are what we call reasonable adjustments. The first is an important one because occupational health services can provide excellent support and feedback for both the student and those supporting them. So occupational health will meet the student and complete a report which outlines the difficulties the student is facing and may even recommend some of the adjustments that can be made. Other important services we involved is a disability service at the university. Most universities have those sorts of services and they will have a good understanding and training in various disabilities, including mental health problems, and can act as an additional resource and support mechanism for the student when they are struggling in practice. We also have a university counselling service. Of course, there are other counselling services outside of the university that the student can access via their own GP. We encourage the student to use that sort of resource because it is independent of the university and practice environment and can be a great source of support for the student. We will then look at initiating programme adjustments and that can include extensions of the practice experience which will allow students more time off when required. So if a student encounters confused thinking or high levels of anxiety we may offer a break from practice so that the student can re-energise and refocus their learning and go back into practice refreshed and take advantage of learning opportunities previously avoided. Also, sometimes something as simple as negotiating a student's shift patterns can help. When somebody is experiencing poor sleep, for example, or they're struggling to get in for an early shift, it may be that having a few later shifts or structuring them slightly differently can alleviate the stress that the student is under and really help them achieve more effectively. We also build in the use of learning contracts. Learning contracts have a great advantage in that they can articulate clearly what is expected both of the student and the clinical placement or mentor and set achievable timescales for accomplishing outcomes. Another important thing to consider if the student is lacking confidence or maybe they've encountered difficult times and they're struggling to believe in themselves is provide opportunities to promote independent decision making. The reason that this is so important is that it builds confidence and so provides lots of positive feedback which links to the next point of the slide. Allowing people enough space to make decisions, not allowing them to struggle in situations is really important because that would just reinforce negative feelings of themselves. I think it's really important that students have the opportunity to make decisions for themselves and to be given enough space to make those decisions in order to develop the skills of independent decision making that, that they will need when they qualify. When somebody is struggling, when they feel low or when they feel bad about themselves, they will need lots of positive reinforcement identifying that they are doing well. Sometimes we need to pick out the really small things that they've done well because when people are feeling low about themselves they will focus just on the negative. So to help a student develop a more positive view of themselves a mentor can identify and discuss a really positive aspect of their practice and their achievement which can be really beneficial to a student's confidence. I'm going to pause now and show the next clip which is from Kirsty who talks about the importance of reasonable adjustments. I'm a second year student nurse suffering with depression. The most important message to give to mentors is that they need to make reasonable adjustments. It's now acceptable to declare if you have dyslexia or some other slight disability. 
In our portfolio, it tells us to talk about if we have any special needs. Mentors need to realise that if you have any mental health problems, it doesn't make you any less competent. We've all been past fit by occupational health. We wouldn't be here if we hadn't passed fit. I have a letter from my GP and from my community mental health team that have all backed up that I'm fit for practice. I just wish I could be honest everywhere. Mentors need to realise that anyone can have a mental health problem and students need to come forward more. If we all came forward, then the stigma would be reduced over time. I think Kirsty's account really illustrates the importance of mentors understanding mental health problems. As she rightly says, it doesn't make an individual less competent if they have a mental health problem. It's more a question of enabling people to achieve the best outcomes they can in the time that they are in placement with a mentor. So in summary, I think we have covered some of the common symptoms of mental health, some of the concerns that students experience when they're undertaking practice, and examples of reasonable adjustment. I'm now going to finish with some examples of generic support strategies for all students, but particularly those with mental health problems. It is really very important that students have the opportunity to familiarise themselves with the practice placement prior to commencement so that they can learn about that placement and be able to identify potential problems which they might need to address. We would look to mentors to welcome students who are taking this initiative and prepare ahead of time. I think the other thing is about disclosure and Kirsty touches on this. We want students to be as open as possible with issues that affect their practice learning, but that will only happen if mentors are open to receiving and hearing that information and treat it sensitively. Knowing that everyone on a ward knows that someone has a mental health problem may not be the most useful strategy. I think it is really important that student mentors treat the information in the same way they treat disclosure from a patient. The other thing we touched on is feedback, but it's about structuring and scheduling regular, honest and constructive feedback sessions throughout the student's placement so that they understand how they are coping, understand how they are progressing and understand where they are achieving their competencies. But also importantly, they understand where there are gaps in their achievement. Linked to this need for the mentor and student to regularly assess those learning needs, set clear objectives, and as we have talked about before, use learning contracts so that both are aware of what the focus learning is about and what they've got to achieve. These progress meetings must be scheduled regularly between the student the mentor and the university to facilitate feedback and made adjustments to the learning objectives and the learning contract. Adaptations are made so that if the student is exceeding expectations you can refine the learning contract objectives that will stretch the student more or if they are not achieving the objectives then they can be refocused and made more achievable. This whole process stands or falls on effective communication and liaison between practice mentors, students and the university and any additional support services that may be involved because we will be scrutinised by professional regulatory bodies like the Nursing and Midwifery Council and Health Professions Council who will now look at how we support students with disabilities and they will look at the mechanisms that we have in place to ensure that the process are both rigorous but also maximise the learning experience for students who can be supported to achieve the very best they can.